Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Open Classroom. I usually start by saying good afternoon, but that is a strange thing to say today because I've got one presenter joining and it's one o'clock in the morning in Thailand and another presenter joining and it's early morning Hawaii. So wherever you are and whatever time of day and greeting applies, welcome to Open Classroom. I'm Janet Gillow, the Director of Professional Development for the Brown School here at Washington University in St. Louis, where it is early afternoon. We are so happy you're with us. For those of you joining on the Zoom webinar, um, the chat feature is enabled. That's how you can send in your greetings as many of you are or questions and comments as the program goes along. I want to extend a special welcome to people joining on YouTube, either right now through our live stream or perhaps catching this recording at a time when you're like not in bed or whatever. Um, we are not able to moderate Q&A through YouTube. So I just wanna let you know a couple of events that are coming up at Open Classroom before we get started today. Our next two events are part of the Brown School Curriculum Showcase. We're doing a series that features the various subspecialties within the degree programs here. So for example, tomorrow, that would be March the 3rd, Ellis Ballard is gonna be with us delivering a program on system models and causal maps. That's part of social system design study here at the Brown School. And then we'll be back on a Tuesday, March the 8th, Vanessa Fabre is delivering a talk on a queer perspective on successful aging. That's part of our gerontology specialization. Uh, so we would love to have you, your friends, your colleagues, come back and join us for any and everything we have going on. Open Classroom is a service that is uh, meant to be available to everybody. Mm -hmm. Love to have you come back. But today, let's get our program started. And to do that, it is my pleasure to pass the microphone over to my friend and colleague, Tammy Orhood, our Director of Global Programs, who's going to introduce our speakers. Thank you very much, Janet. And I'm, I'm really honored to be here with two of our alumni of the Brown School who are from Myanmar, formerly known as Burma. Um, I'm really excited to welcome them. I think they represent the diversity of the Brown School. We have students from all over the world who are now literally practicing all over the world. So I'd like to welcome Juju Minku, who is an active social worker at Queens Medical Center in Hawaii and is a professor at the Thompson School of Social Work and Public Health at the University of Hawaii. And she's a Myanmar community leader. So she was born in Myanmar, Burma, and she lived under a military dictatorship until she and her family were exiled to Thailand at the age of 13. And then she was a master's of social work graduate from WashU in 2016. Her current work includes increasing access to medical health resources for citizens of Myanmar via her social media page, Juju Safe Space. And as a response to the military coup on February 1st, 2021, which we will be talking about in detail today, Juju has increased her community advocacy work to address collective community trauma and to work collaboratively with individuals and women leaders in Myanmar. And then we'd also like to welcome Min Ket Kin who is a PhD student at the, uh, a PhD student of human rights and peace studies at Maidol University in Thailand. She also earned her MSW from Washington University in St. Louis in 20, it was 2021, was it in 2021? 2021. Okay. Right. And she received, um, while she was here, she received Phi Alpha Honor Society status. Professionally, she has more than five years of experience, including her dedication as a humanitarian worker in the Northern Rakhine state during the Rohingya crisis. So when the Myanmar coup happened in February, she was still in, uh, she had actually just returned to uh, Myanmar. She was still completing her degree remotely and also taking to the streets where she led pro-democracy movements. She's the founder of the Myanmar Spring Flowers that is actively involved in supporting civil disobedience, and she's providing humanitarian assistance to internally displaced persons in Kaya State. For her activism and professional work, she's been featured in several different media sources, including KR Asia, The New Humanitarian, and Fortify Rights. I will put the um, links to their, um, the, the agencies, that the organizations that they founded in the chat. But at this point, I would really like us all to welcome our two panelists. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you, Janet, for introducing us. Hi, everybody. Thank you for uh, attending the webinar. Um, so today, 
evening and um, I will be discussing human rights violation in Myanmar and the effect on mental health. And um, so I will start sharing the screen, yeah? Can you all see it? We can. Okay, wonderful. So as you all know, my name is Juju. Um, I am a medical social worker at Queens Hospital. And um, all these clinical skills that I learned here and also working back home in Burma, um, I will be sharing these experience. And I see some of the Myanmar clinician also attending here. So we will be uh, sharing what they are facing in Burma right now as well. So the objective of this workshop is just uh, to raise awareness of witnessing surviving um, when you see the violent, the human rights violation in Burma. And you know, we can't just raise that awareness without asking for action. So we are going to ask your action to take for um, healing in the process of healing in Myanmar communities around the world. Because when you think about Myanmar community, um, we're not just gonna think about only in Myanmar, but also to realize that there is Myanmar community in St. Louis as well, in Hawaii, around the world. Um, so you may run into um, people from Myanmar and please extend your kindness and your action to help them when you see them, when you encounter with them. And also, you know, uh, Nin and I both are humanitarian social worker. We both are in this field. And some of you may be in this field as well or may not be, but understanding that these events in Burma affect our daily life and our loved one as well. So this is our objectives. Um, so I'm gonna touch base a few of the social work values and then I'm gonna hand this um, in to Nin in a minute. So, you know, March is the social work month. So um, happy social work month to everybody. And uh, as we celebrate social work month, um, we need to be reminded with our values as the professionals. The first one is the social uh, social justice and democracy. I mean, democracies we added in there because, you know, without justice, uh, it's hard to, um, maintain a democracy. And in St. Louis or in America, we say that no justice, no peace, right? So the same thing is applying to in Burma as well. No justice, no democracy. And because there's no justice, people are suffering. And we will share how much people are suffering in Burma as well. Um, and again, uh, one of the social work value is dignity and worth or a person. You know, whether it people from Burma or in St. Louis or US or Ukraine, everybody is the person, I mean, the worth of the person. We need to respect people with dignity, whether we look alike or not, or whether we share the same values or cultural background. Um, this is our social work value. And also important of the human relationship. Uh, when we see people suffering, when we see people around the world suffering, um, you know, it's important to build a rapport and relationship and help them to, as we all know that, you know, without having these uh, human relationship, sometimes it is hard to work in the um, healing process or therapeutic work. Um, however, we will touch base these values and the work we do uh, later on the presentation. The dignity of the person, the dignity when we talk about it, you know, uh, we were touch base about uh, how people are treated back home without dignity and what is similar um, in what we face here as well. And again, you know, when we talk about competency and service, we cannot provide services or um, having the knowledge and understanding of what is happening to that person when we, especially one of the social work uh, basic theories, meeting people where they are having these, um, you know, and just having this understanding of how people are experiencing their daily life in Myanmar. So without further ado, uh, let me give this floor to Nin. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Hello, everyone. My name is Lin. So I will give you a brief background on what is happening in Myanmar. Um, so now that we see, you know, we all see what's happening in Ukraine, and I like to say that there are many similarities as well as differences that I hope we can learn from each other of how to respond to those oppressors in our own respective countries. Before we start, I'd like to give you a kind of like a trigger warning, because in the presentation that I'm about to do, there will be some graphic content, especially when we talk about humorous violations. It's not pictures or anything, but it's, you know, some text. So I'd like to tell you guys that if you're uncomfortable with any of the content, please feel free to take a break, have a glass of water, or do whatever you need to do. So we'll just jump into it. Um, so in November 2020, we had a general election in Myanmar, and that at the time, the military refused the election results, and they have been unhappy since then. So in February 2021, they tried to seize the power from Aung San led civilian government by staging a coup. Um, so you might wonder why I use the word um, tried instead of like something else. So the reason is, even though they staged the coup to seize the power, it was not successful because the people are resisting. So as long as the people are resisting, the coup cannot be considered successful. So this is a picture of Aung San Suu Kyi, who leads the civilian government. And then next to her is Mei Aung Lai, who is now leading the military regime, who is basically the source of all the problems happening since the coup. Next slide. So one day after the coup on 2nd of February, people started expressing their disappro disapproval for the military taking over the country. They banged pots and pans to show this. I mean, since COVID, we have seen many countries banging pots and pans for different reasons, but the tradition in Myanmar of banging pots and pans is to drive away the demons. So when the coup happened, people banged pots and pans every night, like 8, 8, uh, 8 p.m to drive away the military hunter, which they consider as evil spirits or demons. Next slide. Thank you. So two days after the coup, <laughs> Joy. two days after the coup, the civil disobedience movement in Myanmar started, which I have been providing support to. Um, what it basically means is that the civil servants do not accept the coup and that they're not willing to work under the military dictatorship. When it first started, it's just a mild form of resistance. Civil servants, particularly from the sector of public health, wore red ribbons to show resistance, but they still go to work. In the you know top right, uh, sorry, top left picture, you can see the doctors wearing red ribbons. But then when the civil disobedience movement became stronger, those government staff do not go to work anymore because they don't want to work under the military dictatorships. So more and more civil, uh, civil servants from different sectors join the movement. And as you can see, they include nurses, doctors, teachers, policemen, and even soldiers. So um, the bottom left picture, the one with green and um, white, those are the teachers. And then the, the, the other ones, you know, nurses and the policemen. So five days, um, next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So um, five days after the coup, mass protests started. As you can see, this is like very huge. The whole country participated in the protest. Um, there were small protests before the sixth, but this is like the sixth is the day when the real anti hunter mass movement started. And the leading organization back then was anti hunter mass movement, which I'm a part of, and also the Federation of General Workers, Myanmar. Since then, the mass movements grew bigger and bigger. And we even have a day called Millions March, where millions of people across the country march, you know, in their respective cities and towns to show resistance. Um, since then, you know, from the side of the hunter, they use water cannons, tear gas, rubber bullets, and all sorts of, you know, stuff to crack down the protests. Next slide. So three days after those mass movements started, on the 9th of February, the first shooting happened. So she is the first protester who was shot and killed. When she was killed, she was only 20 years old. And since then, they started to use live ammunition and even hand grenades to crack down on peaceful protesters. 
Uh, and I will just stop here because since then the Myanmar military has been repeatedly, you know, committing crimes and shooting people and killing people, even humanitarian workers and doctors and nurses. Um, so this is, you know, the brief story of what's happening in Myanmar. Next slide, please. And now is about one year after the coup. And I don't want to go deep into here, but if you'd like to know more, you can check out this link. Um, we will, you know, also copy and paste it there. Um, next slide, please. So this is the data that we have as of 25th February 2022. So what I like to mention here is this is the only data that we can collect, but the real data is far more than this. So this is just like the smallest number, but even the smallest number, more than um, 12,000 people have been arrested and five, uh, 1,500 people have been killed. And this is only the number that have been directly killed by the hunter. We also have like COVID third wave and some other cases where people have been killed in, you know, in an indirect ways. Next slide, please. So at this point, you might be thinking like, who is she, you know, like, why is she here? So I like to show you some of the activities that I've done. Um, so this is, those are the pictures of, you know, that one of the campaigns that I did, which is basically spreading stickers. Um, I did that like two days after the coup. This was also like, you know, featured on different local and international media outlets. Um, next slide, please. So this is the pictures of me before and after the coup. On the left side, you can see me as a humanitarian worker. I was, you know, before the coup, managing a humanitarian project, which supported internally displaced people in Northern Rakhine State during the Rohingya crisis. And the pictures on the left, uh, sorry, on the right, are the ones where I was involved in anti honda mass movement. Um, as you can see in the, you know, like the bottom picture, I was wearing a helmet. And when we protest, we have to wear helmets and, you know, protective gear to protect ourselves during strikes because they use hand grenades, tear gas, like, you know, all the, all the cruel things. Um, next slide, please. So um, this is the tweet that I posted in March about how the coup affected me personally and how the city that I used to live was impacted by it. So the city that I live, which is called Yangon, is the largest city in Myanmar. And right now it doesn't even look like a city anymore because, you know, because of all the ruins and all the all the explosions and all these things. So I was born and raised in Yangon and then I grew up there. So if, you know, if you ask me before the coup how to define Yangon, I will talk about street food and traffic. But now it's not like that anymore. There were brickades and explosions and, you know, it's almost like a war zone. Um, okay. And um, even like when I'm telling you about all these stories, like I, I can still feel the pain because this is not how I expect the country to become. Um, because we lived under the military dictatorship for many years and the civil war has been ongoing for more than 70 years. It has only been a few years that the country was open to the world and we could travel freely and the international businesses can come to Myanmar and work. So the country had just opened up, but now everything is gone. Everything was taken away with just one person, May Online's decision, just one decision and it ruins many people's life, including mine. Um, so, I mean, we also talked in the beginning that I'm now in Thailand. Um, and the reason that I'm here is because of the coup. So if, if it wasn't for the, you know, for the revolution or the coup, I would still be in Myanmar. I would be contributing to the country's development rather than, you know, being a part of revolution. And then I would be at home with my family, you know, enjoying street food in Yangon and enjoying nightlife and everything. But because of the coup, I'm sitting here in an apartment at the border between Thailand and Myanmar and talking about the coup. So I just want you to understand how it has impacted me personally and why I'm here telling you all of these because um, I went back to home from the US to Myanmar in January 
but in February the coup happened. And when the coup happened, I still I was still doing my last semester online. So I was just, you know, protesting during the day and then writing my assignments at night. So that's basically what I've been doing. Um, thank you. Next. So uh, moving on, like I said before, uh, the Myanmar military has been committing mass atrocity crimes since the coup. But it's not new because they have been committing since, you know, since very, very long time. They have committed genocide in the past, the Rohingya genocide. And then they have also committed, you know, war crimes during the 70 year long civil war. And then now they're committing crimes against humanity since the coup. And under the international law, when the state, when a state manifestly fails to protect their own, own population or um, deliberately commits such crimes, the international community has the responsibility to protect those populations. And that is the reason why I'm doing this presentation here at WashU, because I realized that, the, you know, like the support from the international community is very important, especially in terms of R2P. And as we can see how the, how the world has been helping Ukraine, we also need such kind of support in Myanmar. Even though the coup happened one year ago, we're still suffering. And, you know, if it's the first time or the millionth time, people still suffer. So we need help from you. We need help from the international community. And that's why I'm here. And um, if the international community do not help us now, you know, who knows, maybe it'll be too late. You know, we don't want to become another Syria or another Yemen or another Rwanda. That's why I'm, you know, doing this presentation to ask help from you and the international community. Um, next slide, please. So um, there are a few case studies that I like to present, you know, so that you know how the Myanmar military has been committing crimes that I just mentioned. The first case is the use of human shields. Um, you can read, but I will also read it out. So um, these are the case studies that I got from Fortify, right? Um, it's a public report. You can also read that. Um, I will also uh, leave the references after this. Um, so the Myanmar soldiers have been using an 18 year old student as a human shield. And, you know, they, they took them to the main road and tied their hands, cover them like blindfold, and then they put the cans on the shoulder of the person, the 18 year old student and fight between the people's defense forces and military troops. And then they were also tortured in detention. Next slide, please. Oh, the previous one, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is like basically talking about how they have been tortured. Next slide, please. And then crimes against humanity and war crimes. Um, on the Christmas Eve of 2021, the Myanmar soldiers massacred at least 40, 40 civilians. The exact number is 45, including a child and two humanitarian workers um, working with the safe, working with safety children. And um, I will talk about it like on the next slide. Next slide, please. So when they found the bodies of those 45 people, um, you know, as he wrote here, he can't believe his eyes. They were brutally killed and the corpses were so gruesome and some of them were even hard to identify. No hands, no lugs, nothing. Next slide, please. And then, I mean, as you can read here, how they have been tortured and how they killed them. It seems like those people have been um, tortured before they were burned alive, but we're still trying to investigate that case. But like I said, 45 people have been killed and burned alive. And when they found them, even their skulls were broken. This is actually supposed to be a case study, you know, like a discussion. So, but now I'm just reading it out. Um, I hope you won't mind. And then you can also read it later when I leave the, um, when I leave this in the chat. 
And then the third case is sexual assault in detention. So one of the democracy activists was in prison for six months and she was sexually assaulted in the prison. Um, thank you. So I will just stop here and um, give it over back to Juju. She will talk more about how those things impact our mental health. Um, actually, this was supposed to be a you know group discussion, but because of that, we didn't have the time to do it, but I hope you won't mind. And then Juju will take over. Thank you. Thank you so much. So as you can see, you know, people in Myanmar or Burma is the same country with two different names, just in case if you were wondering. Um, anyway, so people back home are suffering um, as Nin was describing. And, um, you know, so people like her, humanitarian workers, human rights defenders, and also Myanmar clinicians, we also uh, see a lot of suffering in them as well. And daily life people experience, you know, I'll describe in short term and long term effect on our mental health. And uh, some of you may be aware or familiar with this five stages of grief. But if we go into details, how um, we are seeing these symptoms is mainly the uh, grief and loss. You know, we lost our democracy, we lost our hope. However, we have to restore hope and in order to restore the democracy. That's why our um, clinical work is so important to heal people, to heal the nation. So um, because we lost our loved one, the death or the being uh, put in the prison and a lot of people were uh, killed by the COVID-19 and it was also systematic um, mascara because I will go into detail in a minute about how COVID-19 was managed in Burma. And a lot of people lost their um, livelihood, you know, because um, a lot of people left the city to fight against the gov uh, the military. And also, um, you know, once you join the um, civil CDM, civil disobedient movement, um, you also sometimes uh, got fired from your work. So there's a lot of um, loss and grief in the community. That's where we see. And also the anger, you know, it's all started from being disrespected our votes and our voice. And, you know, we were not treated as the dignity because in at the same time, if you remember in November uh, 2020 in the US, we also had elections and our democracy was also threatened. However, we have, um, you know, the check and balance system here. So it was, it was not that, uh, it, it was it didn't go down in the same way like what happened in Burma. Um, so sometimes you may be, you know, here in the US, we might be taking um, democracy for granted. Um, but when the system is being threatened and shaken, things really happen. People suffer. That's what we're seeing in, in Burma as well. And also, uh, you know, part of the um, loss and grief is the bargaining, right? Um, the survivor guilt, why am I here? Why not me? My parents shouldn't be dying because my dad was um, killed in the third wave of COVID and I, there was no enough hospital or um, healthcare facility and healthcare professionals because most of the doctors and nurses are put in the jail. And um, so, you know, if you want to go to the hospital, you need to get the referral. That referral process may take, um, you know, three days. And one of my aunt, she passed away in this, uh, going through this referral process instead of just going to the hospital to get treatment. And my dad didn't get enough oxygen to breathe. Uh, there was no enough ventilator in the hospital. They were also, there was also shortage of um, oxygen in the uh, community. So, you know, he didn't get what he needed to survive. Um, after that, you know, my mom passed away in within five months from losing my dad. I believe it was from depression and heartbreak, although she died from heart attack. So, you know, even though I'm living outside of the country, I still have my loved one, my family members and uh, my community. Whoever loved this country, whether you're a foreigner or Burmese or white person or black person, it's, it's all a fact to us in some way. And uh, a part of it also, we 
people starting to feel hopeless. That's why I'm doing a lot of talk with young people as well, because, uh, you know, since there is no, uh, the schools are also closed, um, since there's no stable stability inside the country with the job and the school and a lot of people are starting to feel hopeless and their dream a uh, crash and uh, it's hard to see the future um, without democracy and stability back home and uh, Nin had described the R2P, the responsibility to protect. And we feel like we are so far away from the rest of the world and we also look different. And, um, you know, with Ukraine, Ukraine is getting a lot of attentions and um, they, they get a lot of media attention as well. When it, that happened to Burma, uh, we did get attention for like a month after that, everything just, you know, calm down, and it, we feel like we're not getting uh, attention or help from the the rest of the international community. So you know, we are on our own. We, we have to help each other and survive and uh, protect ourselves. So in the way that we're protecting ourselves, we would do anything to re restore democracy and peace in our country, and that could in any means. So um, we're not going to be criticized by the international community how we should restore democracy in peacefully. And uh, because we're facing these um, chronic um, crisis, people are, you know, you have to, we talk about a new normal um, after the COVID and there's like constant new normal people has to adjust. Um, so, you know, <clears throat> some of the adjustment that people are facing is sometimes uh, more, so we still have civil war happening right now uh, across the country. So when the war is happening, you're gonna see refugees and refugees are fleeing into neighboring countries like India, Thailand, China. And when you are in different country, although it seems like, okay, it's also Asian culture, Asian country, but it's different lifestyle, different uh, cultural and belief system. And you have to adjust again to fit in and also that's like if you were manageable to leave the country. If you're staying in the country, you're still living under the fear because you you could be arrested anytime. Even attending to a, a workshop that organized by American school, that could be a danger. So, you know, um, just having these all these anxieties is um, people are suffering from insomnia uh, that could lead into depression and um, anxiety. And um, we see a lot of suicidal behavior in clinicians and um, humanitarian workers as well. So this is like what is happening that we notice, but in the long term, what we could see is because we are living in constant fear, um, you know, we, we are also, seeing a lot and witnessing a lot of trauma. Um, there are three types of traumas that you can see in our community. The, so as you know, firsthand trauma you experience as the person of the event. And the secondary trauma is what uh, clinicians and humanitarian workers are facing. Um, because we hear a lot of these horror stories and we are trying to help people heal. At the same time, we have to heal ourselves as well. And again, the resources for humanitarian worker and clinicians are very limited because again, you know, the community is very small um, in the way of healing process. Uh, we don't have another clinician to refer to get treated as well. Um, so that is what we're seeing. And also um, intergenerational trauma due to the civil war. Again, like Nin was describing, this is this coup is not the first time. Um, and in the North Kitchen State and then in Indian State, the civil war has been going on for more than 50 years. And um, again, you know, there's a lot of uh, intergenerational trauma that we are um, openly starting to talk about it because we didn't like mental health became very popular and trending back home now. But again, uh, the qualified clinicians are very limited to be able to help properly or with the licensures. Um, so as I explained that, you know, mental health services are limited and the resources are also limited. When I say resources, what do you need to treat people? Well, we do need funding, we do need, uh, skills and trainings, that's where you can jump in. So I'm gonna ask your help in a minute later. So because of these, uh, uh, you know, lack of support and resources, and there's also very limited 
understanding of mental health in our community leaders. Uh, the mental health clinicians and professionals are just swimming in the mud. Uh, we're getting, sometimes we feel like we're getting nowhere, although we're working so hard until we drop. So we see a lot of professional burns out. I see some of my colleagues get sick often. I see uh, a lot of frustration in the community. Um, there's a, the demand is so high that we can't meet that demand. We can't, the service is very limited, but you know, we're gonna have to do what we have to do to heal our communities. And again, because we are constantly struggling, living in a constant fear uh, as a country, the human resource and capacity to build a country is also decreasing. And you could even describe Burma as a failed state. So, you know, in order to restore democracy in Burma, we have to restore hope. And um, as you notice that I'm wearing white top because that's what I wear uh, during my uh, graduation ceremony in 2016, our civil rights leader, John Lewis, um, gave the speech in my graduation. And um, he said that, you know, we're not going to live a life without problems or challenges. In order to overcome our barriers, sometimes you have, to, of course, we're going to have to face it, but we don't need to bang our head to the wall, we can be creative. We can just go around the problem or jump over it, go underneath it. As long as we reach to our goal, as long as we are being creative, as long as we are alive, we can stay solve any problem, anything that we want to overcome. So I have this mindset that Mr. Lewis, uh, you know, put it in my mind, uh, since I graduated. I mean, his, his speech is not the only thing that changed my life. Just being in the um, social justice movement when I was in St. Louis in 2014, 16, there's the Black Lives Matter movement uh, is going strong. So, you know, a part of it is um, restored in my mind how we need to restore hope and justice in Burma as well. Um, again, you know, Previously, I was just talking about the suffering and the um, in, injustice in my community, but also I see the resi uh, resiliency in my community. There is a, a lot of things happening, a lot of suffering, a lot of um, illness, mental illnesses. However, um, there's also collective, collectivism across the globe. Like I said, we have Burmese community in St. Louis, in Hawaii, in Thailand, India, China, uh, you know, Norway, Australia, around the world, 10% of the Burmese communities, uh, Burmese population is outside of the country. So all these people come together to help us to uh, do anything like humanitarian aids, uh, healing process, um, you know, fighting back, anything uh, to get attention from the international government, anything to restore our democracy, because we got to taste the freedom for, you know, five, 10 years uh, minimum, but it's freedom tastes so good and we are not ready to let it go. So, you know, what something that I am proud of and that I have been uh, working on is the Juju Safe Space, and that is uh, started as the online platform that I talk about mental health issues back home starting in 2019 but actually I got lucky four days before the coup um, I create I registered it as the nonprofit organization in Hawaii and we have been working with a woman organization um, or also other community leaders and community members to process their fears, anger, excitement, any feelings that they need to process in or in order to survive. So, you know, we can't just live in the survival mode. We need to thrive. We need to be able to create it. We need to be able to restore the hope and democracy in our country. So um, in Actually, this month, March 11 to 13, um, I am working with Myanmar clinicians and community leaders to organize, uh, to present mental health conference in, online. So if you are uh, interested, you are welcome to attend as well. It will be from Zoom. And, um, you know, I believe that hope is something we can definitely afford. Um, when I graduated, you know, we talk about like, what is it like to work in a community with people in St. Louis? Um, and there's a lot of hope 
that we can also restore in St. Louis with this um, social justice movement and as well as in Burma, because without hope, there's no light in the tunnel. So that is something we build on. We hold on and we build hope. And we don't just talk about hope in terms of hopeful or feeling good about it. I mean, there are a lot of things that I have seen in evidence that, you know, people are resilient. Uh, Burmese people are funny. Like um, when they see these, you know, gun shootings, um, probably in the beginning of this uh, coup, people are like, happy new year, happy new year, because like, we're not scared. We're just gonna be like, you know, uh, using our humor to survive, or uh, we have this, um, amazing community around the world that is pulling people together to restore the democracy. So again, and I said in the beginning, we're not just here to talk about and give you information. We want your action as well, because without action, awareness is uh, meaningless. So again, if you can see that in the logo, that time is right for social worker. That is the theme for social work month, uh, the, the, the theme from the NAS value that we're celebrating. I mean, I see social worker roles in the White House, in the community, in across the world, in the hospital, in the clinicians. Uh, you know, our role is so important, especially during this pandemic, we play such an important role to save our community and working along with nurses and doctors. We may not get the credit as much as we should be, but we have to advocate for our role as well. That's something what Washu had taught me, like, you know, people are gonna undercut you whether we pay or your profession or your competency, but you have to market. And again, you know, like I said, the time is right, it's time, the time is to jump in and help uh, whether people in St. Louis, Burma or Ukraine, you know, so let's think about our role and our work as the clinician, as social worker, community leaders, student, whatever role you may be playing in. We do, if you truly believe in democracy, we do have responsibility to help people heal. So what I would like to um, you know, accomplish one thing from you is, go ahead and put it in the chat box. How do you feel after you listen to the struggle of Burmese people? And again, when you go home, I want you to take one thing and think about when you see uh, the war and suffering, just don't talk about it. Take an action, you know, um, extend your hand to help these Burmese refugees in St. Louis or, you know, Ukrainian refugees or, when you see these people, what is the action that you're gonna take? Think about it because we want you to come here and you know uh, take action to help these people who are suffering around the world and around the globe. So um, without further ado, let me uh, stop our presentation here. And if you have any question, please let us know. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Min and Juju. That was really uh, quite a presentation, very eye-opening. Um, and as someone who has been following the situation, I mean, I, I learned so much more. Um, okay, so um, we do have a couple of questions in, in the chat. So we're gonna get started with those. Um, so Angel asks how the people in Myanmar can use their resources to regain the independency. So you want to talk about the what the people in Myanmar can do first? That would be great. Okay. So the question is, uh, what we should do to regain that freedom? This the first question is specifically addressed to the people in Myanmar, but really, the I think it's it's a question about you know what resources are available. And how um, anyone who is interested in, in this situation can get involved. Um, so I would just talk about what I see in the communities. And again, when we talk about Burma, uh, think about that 10% of population around the globe. So we're using these strengths to stay connected. And definitely you can get involved with Burmese community in St. Louis as well. Um, so we are doing, you know, international community to recognize the unite um, the unity NUG government. 
um, unity national government, who is the parallel um, with the military junta. But this is the government that is presenting the democracy. The per, like, please jump, jump in here if I miss something, yeah? So definitely you can support them and make them legalize uh, the legitimate government in the international uh, community, international diplomacy work. Um, so that's one thing that you can do it in the uh, diplomatic way, diplomacy and uh, humanitarian aid that you can definitely donate. You can keep in touch with us um, right now. You know, I'm working on supporting two mobile clinics. So when you hear mobile clinics, the doctors and nurses on run, they have to go around and help people who got shot or who got injured during fighting against this military. So, you know, you can definitely donate our projects and then can talk about our projects as well. Um, so, you know, and also uh, staying in touch with your local um, legis legislature. So in Hawaii, I am also a president of Myanmar Association. We write to our um, legislature to support the Burma bill. Um, so, you know, our, our representation is very important, our voices, we have the freedom to, re, you know, make sure our voices are heard. Uh, we have that democratic platform in the US to keep our politicians uh, give close attention to Burma crisis. So that's at least three things you can do easily. Thank you. And if you can put any of those in the chat that we haven't already done, I think that would be very useful for the, the people um, who are listening to the presentation. Yes. Uh, I'll put my email so you can keep in touch with me. Is there anything you want to add in, Yamali? Yeah, I just want to add that, the, you know, in Myanmar, the whole system is failing and the economy is not doing well. Like, the country, you know, is leading towards to become a failed state, which some people said is already a failed state. So the resources that the people can use are very limited. So basically, we're depending on the people, the Myanmar people who are outside of the country, like me and Juju and many other people, and then um, the international community. So your support is needed. And then if you want to support people, you can support different ways like civil disobedience movement or humanitarian or any other things. Like uh, Juju has mentioned, you can also donate to international organizations and stuff like that. But I think the best way is to support the local grassroots people rather than through the international organizations because the international organizations have limited access inside the country and there are many places that they cannot go, but the local people, they can go. So if you really want to support the people, I think you should directly support the people. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. You know, when we were talking before this program began, um, I did not realize how much personal loss each of you has sustained. And I, I want to start by just please extending my sympathies because how much grief and how much loss and how complicated a situation. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, you know, it's it's a lot, but I appreciate you bringing it to all to our attention. I want to pivot uh, in our discussion, uh, something that John raised, um, that as Brown School trained social workers, this is going to be uh, near and dear to your heart when we think about evidence-based practice and um, clinical interventions that are effective with trauma survivors. I mean, we know that um, with people that are experiencing PTSD or similar, you know, some of the most effective interventions are cognitive processing therapy, prolonged exposure therapy, EMDR. I'm just wondering, do you all have a take? Do either of you have a take on whether those interventions are culturally appropriate and relevant? Or is that a, you know, a, a good way to go with uh, trauma survivors from, me, from Myanmar? Or are there better ways to think about this? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, any of these uh, therapeutic work and trainings, if we could provide to the Myanmar clinician, that would be such a traumatic help. Because uh, again, you know, we can afford these trainings. These are in dollars. It's so expensive for Myanmar clinicians to receive. So, you know, again, I mean, we are in touch now, but I also uh, want to make sure um, Myanmar community and, you know, the St. Louis University is also in touch 
because uh, when I live in St. Louis, there's uh, at least uh, 500 Burmese refugees are in St. Louis. So there's something you can extend your hand as well. But again, going back to the therapeutic work, um, you know, I did my um, dialectical behavior therapy fellowship with uh, Professor Ryan Lindsay. Um, so I do use my therapeutic work when I work with the uh, uh, Burmese community to help them here, especially the distress tolerance skills, um, you know, mindfulness, dis uh, distress tolerance skills, because there's a lot of distraction going on. So, you know, uh, the, we, we are in the survival mode daily, but we need to overcome. We need to be able to uh, thrive again. So, um, yeah, I think all these, you know, therapeutic work and trainings that, that we could receive from the school to uh, deliver in our clinician and Burmese community, that will be a wonderful uh, opportunity for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. I do want to um, just remind all of the participants, if you have any questions or comments or anything, please do put that in the chat. We're monitoring it so we can um, elevate that for you. Um, so I'm actually going to ask a question that I think is sort of on the top of everyone's mind. But, um, you know, Ukraine is getting a lot of attention in the press and, and the, um, the international community. And you spoke about a responsibility to protect, which quite frankly, I think is probably a new concept for a lot of Americans. So um, I'm, I'm interested in, in having you uh, expand on that. And then maybe you can tell us a little bit about what, what Ukraine has done effectively to engage the international community. Are there any lessons learned there for your own um, fight, um, especially when it comes to social media and PR and that sort of thing? Right. Um, so yeah, I talked a little bit about responsibility to protect, which is called R2P. Um, so what it basically means is there are four mass atrocity crimes that I just mentioned in the slides. Um, genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity and ethnic cleansing. So when the states um, fail to protect their population from those crimes, or when they are the ones who are deliberately committing those crimes, the international community has the responsibility to protect by, you know, possible means in an um, effective and timely manner. So I think in terms of Ukraine, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think in terms of Ukraine, it's getting a lot of international, uh, international attention because it's between two states. But in Myanmar, people consider this as an internal conflict it's like, oh, this is like an internal conflict. And Myanmar has been um, having the civil war for 70 years. So like they normalize it, you know, they tolerate it. Yeah. Like when you talk about Syria or Yemen or Rwanda, people just normalize it. They're like, oh, this is Syria. They have lots of armed conflict. This is Myanmar. They have Rohingya genocide. But it does not mean that we have to let it go or we have to let it happen, right? Because like I said in the slides as well, Violence is always violence, whether it's the first time or the millionth time, whatever it is, it's still violence. So, so yeah, so I think that's where the responsibility to protect plays. And, um, but I think in terms of Ukraine, you know, they were getting lots of attention by the international media um, and their struggle have been promoted and supported by, widely by the world, um, which one of the things that we've been talking about is the race you know, their whiteness, um, but, you know, I don't want to just say something, you know, irresponsible because, you know, I don't want people to think that I'm not supporting Ukrainians. Of course, we're supporting Ukrainians, but I think in terms of RTP, you know, people, the international community, the Western countries, the, the, the countries that have the, the ultimate power, they kind of look at their interests and how it can impact their countries. So, you know, we were just talking about it earlier. This is a case of Russia invading Ukraine. What if China invades Myanmar? It'll be a whole different story. Um, do you, you want something to Yeah, add? I mean, um, you know, thank you for being sensitive to the race card. But as you know, we are a social worker and there is a, we can't ignore the elephant in the room. There's a race is always an issue in any 
politics or um, you know the help the the resources the how the U.S. government contribute because I I was just teaching that in my class last night about uh, the representation of race in Hawaii community and that's it's important to have the correct information how these U.S. census are important to in order to allocate the funding yeah so again what I'm trying to say here is that yeah you know Nina and I are two little Asian girls but we are not just Asian we are social worker we are just like you you know and when you see whether Ukrainian or another country, I mean, let's just focus on that because um, it's feel closer to you because uh, Ukrainian are uh, uh, Caucasian and it's easier to connect their experience and the suffering. But when you see Asian or uh, Afghanistan's or, you know, uh, Sudanese are suffering, it's feel foreign to you. It may feel that way because, uh, it's hard to relate, but suffering is suffering. When we all suffer, it's affect us one way or another. Like I said, it's a ripple effect, yeah? I, even I live so far away from my country, my family is affected, I am affected, you know? My people are suffering, I am affected. When I am affected, the work I do contribute in Hawaii or St. Louis or in the US is going to be affected. So we all are interconnected in uh, one way or another. Absolutely, we are. Uh, so we're getting some powerful comments from um, Diana, who I believe is um, in Myanmar now, talking about um, sort of the lack of mental health resources that are available. And I, I want to dovetail those comments. So she was mentioning 10 master's level clinicians. I'm not sure in what area and for what population, but my hunch is for a whole lot of people, just 10 uh, people that we would consider qualified mental health professionals. So you had mentioned that um, schools are closed. And uh, I also had mentioned that there are potential consequences for people to even participate in a webinar. And I'm, I'm gonna tee up many things that you could go in a few different directions to reply to. But I mean, that certainly creates a, a generational capacity of a workforce and a population. If young people aren't going to school, if college students aren't going to graduate school. Um, so what I, I'm, I'd love for you to expand on what's been said, but I'm also curious, like from a distance, what can, you know, what can open classroom do? What can um, people that, you know, were at best internet connected, how, how can we be helpful? Um, sorry, one thing I like to add here before Juju responds to the question. Um, before I went to the US to get my master's, we only have seven person who got master of social work, like seven in the whole country, because we don't have a master, uh, we don't have a social work department or education in Myanmar, it's like none. So, so yeah, I just want to say how like these, these knowledge and resources are very limited. Sorry, we can, we can take. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for mentioning that because it's easier to see when you see the number, yeah? Um, that's why, you know, I'm not gonna enjoy my paradise here. I'm gonna go back and give as much as I can. Um, you know, I, people like me who were born in Burma, but also doing clinical work, we reconnected with our Myanmar clinicians and also we gave a lot of like online trainings and treatment and um, community buildings. Um, so what the Brown School could do is, you know, we can also um, offer trainings to these clinicians and also, you know, giving more, uh, I, I guess, you know, in the way that providing scholarship to uh, Myanmar students more like not just one or two a year that's what I saw when I was in uh, St. Louis I had one other Burmese student and the next year there are two students it's very the proportion is very important yeah especially if we're going to invest uh, to heal people from the suffering we need to create more opportunity for the people who can actually help so what I'm saying is maybe we should give more scholarship to uh, Burmese if it might be a little bit uh, challenging but we can find a way to work it out um, and also another thing is that you know we like again the resources are limited um, but Burmese people are very creative uh, we 
can definitely find a way to uh, stay connect inside the country in St. Louis, in Hawaii, and any way we could. Thank you. Thank you for uh, validating our experience and also, you know, extending our your hand to help my communities and also, you know, giving us this opportunity to share and um, bring in these different communities together. Well, thank you so much for for being with us for bringing focus back on something that for many of us hasn't been receiving the attention that it deserves. We are at time. I want to thank our audience for hanging in, thank our presenters, and I want to give you an opportunity to, to give us a last thought. Um, the, the one thing that you hope somebody will take away, the one thing that maybe you hope they will do, um, just so that it's the last thing in their, in their head as we say goodbye today. Um, you do you want the audience to put it in the chat box? As no, well? for 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 our speakers, please. Gotcha. I'd gotcha. like I'd like you to uh, remind the audience of a, or frame a message of just you know like if you're going to do one thing now, um, <laughs> or remember one fact that was shared. Yes. So. It's hard to say just one thing because, and again, you know, it's, we are all interconnected. And if you're in St. Louis, extend your help to Burmese refugees and community. If you are around the world and want to uh, provide uh, services to heal the suffering, um, please stay in touch with us, uh, provide trainings and funding, and, uh, you know, also write to your congressman state, support the Burma bill that Nian has provided in the link. Um, so, you know, use your democracy and um, anything that we have this freedom to use, restore the democracy to democratic country to each other. Thank you. Okay, um, <laughs> sorry, I was just looking at the, the slides. Um, I think one thing, like one, the only thing, the only, the only thing is um, look at what your governments are doing and like educate yourself, not like look at it in a rude way, but like educate yourself and how your governments are involved in different, you know, different crises or like contributing to or involving in different crises because um, the U.S. have been very helpful in providing, you know, um, asylums to many people in Myanmar and then they have the Burma bill um, as well as, you know, they have been like helping other countries as well. So I think it's very important um, you know, to notice how your governments are um, contributing to or evolving different conflicts in other countries. Um, and just one last thing is that I also talked about it in the, in the, in the presentation as well, that we should never tolerate nor normalize violence or oppression wherever or whatever that happens it happens and people suffer. So whether it's Syria or Ethiopia, Tigray or Myanmar, you know, no matter how many times it's people still suffer. So there is absolutely no reason to normalize or tolerate violence. Thank you. The perfect thought to end this. Yeah. Thank you both so close. much for bringing this to us. And Tammy, thank you so much for co-hosting. Um, hard things to hear, but important ones. I appreciate the audience being here and I hope we'll see you again at another open classroom very soon. Take care everybody. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Goodbye now. Thank you.